What again may be our final question here. This one was sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Bronco Bronson. And actually, no, it wasn't. It was sent on Twitter using the hashtag Corny Drive Through. Now that I realize I said everything wrong. But here's his question Can Jim explain the relationship between Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart? Every time Hogan has made an appearance in WWE throughout the past few years, Jimmy Hart was with him in most occasions despite the short tenure as Hogan's manager in WWF and WCW. On air, of course, he's referring to there. Yes. So what is the role of Jimmy Hart in Hulk Hogan's life, and what is the relationship? Jimmy has actually been at various points, and I'm not saying Jimmy was like his agent, like was negotiating his film roles or whatever, but Jimmy Hart is the most energetic, go-getting motherfucker in the world. Jimmy Hart knows this going back to when he was a manager in Memphis, he was on radio stations every week because not only did he have the music background, but he was glib and he was a celebrity in Memphis, but he'd go to other places. He was, he's a publicity machine. He works his ass off. He's dependable. He's honest. You can hand Jimmy the key to your fucking money vault and, you know, not worry about it. And when they were, and, and Hulk had known Jimmy since Memphis. I mean, when Hulk came back and did that one match with Lawler in 81, Jimmy was his manager. And Jimmy's told me the story and uh, before of exactly how Hulk made him the offer, and I don't want to retell it because I won't get all the details right or when the time frame that it was, but basically, Hogan, I mean, as a as a big star and not only doing wrestling, but also media and also movie parts and traveling around or whatever, he wanted somebody that could, you know, help him with keeping track of shit and doing publicity and, and just a, a loyal, responsible, dependable person to handle a lot of his shit. And he had Jimmy for a number of years. It, it wasn't like, Oh, Jimmy, I'll get you booked over at so-and-so he had Jimmy on a salary to be his, you know, his manager, quote unquote, in a variety of things. Um, and they've just always got along. And so I, I got to admit that uh, I don't see why somebody else hasn't done that before because Jimmy just, he's, he's insane. I mean, it's not like they live together and they're inseparable now and they, you know, they're still working together on a regular basis. But if Hogan has a project or something that comes up if he's going to a wrestling promotion for a, a period of time, or if he's just doing something on location or publicity, a lot of times he'll have Jimmy go with him. And they've just, you know, they've been friends that way, but but uh, Jimmy's invaluable in terms of being, you know, his his guy Friday, his, his man, his man in charge, his manservant, if you will. Um. And that's that's how that came about, but that was a legitimate business relationship and not something that was being just booked and they didn't have any anything to do with each other outside of on camera wrestling. Were you surprised by it? I mean, knowing Hogan and his knowing the Hogan's reputation, he's surprised that Jimmy Hart did it and has put up with Hogan and that they seem to get along? <laughs> Well, no, but J Jimmy has, I don't know that Jimmy Hart has ever put up with anybody. Jimmy is so happy and up and jovial. Remember Doc, Dr. Tom Pritchard, when he'd see me and Jimmy sitting, he'd say, oh, there they are, the feather and the spike. You know, Jimmy's like, oh, poo-poo, I love you. Everything's great. Oh, oh we're doing it. And I'm like, oh, this motherfucker and fuck this and fuck that. Um, Jimmy doesn't have to put up with anybody. Jimmy loves being out and being active. Jimmy loves, he... <laughs> I get. I don't know if he's still the same way, but when all the years I knew him, he slept maybe four or five hours a night. He was always. He lived in Memphis in the Memphis territory, but he was up first thing on a Monday morning, going doing the radio, plugging the show that night at the Coliseum. He'd be the first one to Louisville the next day, four hundred miles away. Never missed a shot. He's dependable. He's loyal, and he's he's smart to the business and show business. So as far as and also, as far as Jimmy having to put up with Hogan, I mean, you know, my God, if if uh, if you're Jimmy Hart, there's people probably easier to put up with that aren't the biggest star in your chosen business and aren't going to pay you a salary to just 
fucking travel the world with him. So I don't think it was hard on Jimmy's part. And for Hogan, Jimmy Hart has to be the most unobtrusive, unoffensive, and unannoying person in the history of the world. So that was that was no reach. So I I don't wonder that they got along and still do, apparently. He was so reliable, waking up early, doing all those radio shows. He was also the top heel in the territory for several years and so important and really, in my eyes, one of Lawler's greatest rivals, if not the greatest rival, actually, yeah. Jimmy Hart. How well was he paid? I mean, should they have done anything different? Ooh, yeah, there, they I mean, <laughs> is there a world where they're able to pay him to not go to the WWF and he's figured in for whatever the future is? And of course, we know how things would end. But in terms of how he was paid or taken care of there and leaving, what are your thoughts? No, there's no world in which they would have paid him anywhere near what he made in the WWF. Even though he, you could make the case that he was worth it, although by 1984 and when he left and the expansion business had gone down a little bit from the peak years, but you could still you could make the claim that he was worth almost anything because of just how over he was and how he had carried that territory on the heel side. But you can also make the realistic case that Jerry Jarrett wasn't going to pay anybody as much money as they were going to make in the WWF, whether they were worth it or not. Um, and, you know, Jimmy had the opportunity. He'd had his feelings hurt a number of times because they could have paid him more than they did. <clears throat> and now, you know, I'm saying a, a top heel, and Jimmy was that for some time. I never asked him about his check. Um, I know what I was making when he was on top of me, and he'd had to be at least twice that. So... You know, if Jimmy's making seven, eight hundred to a thousand dollars a week in the Memphis territory in nineteen eighty two, what is that worth today? Seven hundred to a thousand dollars in nineteen eighty two would today would be probably two or three grand. That was comfortable, but it wasn't it wasn't gonna be what you know what he could make in New York, and he wanted to yeah, I guess he felt like he had done everything that he could in Memphis, and also he felt like he wanted to be more appreciated and more highly paid and and take the chance at that point. When he got in the business in 79, he was just happy to be Lawler Stooge and stand there and hold the mic or stand there and hold the belt because he didn't he had no other experience. But after five or six years and uh, obviously being good, and everybody making over him and him having been in the top spot in the company, he wanted to try to see if he could do, if he could hang with the big boys. Um, so overall, you know, yeah, they could have taken care of him, but they couldn't pay him not to go if he wanted to go. And then if they'd have set that precedent, paying a manager more than anybody else in the company was making besides Lawler would have been just crazy. So it it just, you know, there wasn't going to be any other thing but that happening. If WWF had the spot open, he was going to take it, which he did. And that was part of the reason then he was able to, you know, tell Vince and the guys up there, well, look, there's this Randy Savage down there. Boy, he's wild. And and get some, you know, some of the other boys a, a chance or a look-see or a spot or whatever. 